now electronic newsletter. Our newsletters are no longer going to be printed and mailed. They are going to be sent email. So if you'd like that sent to you email, we will need you to go out there back by all the rest of the signups. Sign up for a small group while you're back there as well. And I just want to thank everybody for their prayers and all I've been on my recovery of all my surgeries. So thank you. All right, and, and uh, to add to the, the newsletter bit, we are going to print newsletters and have them available uh, on a table outside after worship. And so if you want to like that paper in your hands, we'll, we'll make that accommodation. All right, well, if there are no other announcements this morning, I invite you to stand and greet your neighbor with peace Christ. And uh, fist bumps of peace or elbows of peace if you're so this is <laughs>
want you to remain standing, please, and join in the call to worship in your bulletin. Come to worship this day. Bring with you all your joys and sorrows. Come to worship this day, leaving the power of God through Jesus Christ. Come to worship this day, feeling the presence of God. Amen. Please join in our song of praise, mighty to save. The words are found on the screen.
Jesus going with the disciples in the Capernaum. And he gets there, and it's the Sabbath day. Do anybody know what is Sabbath? What is the Sabbath day? Jackson. The day of rest. Is today our Sabbath day? Sunday kind of the day? Maybe not at home, huh? <laughs> but for church today, today is our Sabbath day, right? And so Jesus gets there, and he walks into the synagogue, and they're, they're studying, and they're preaching, and they're talking to the people, and he walks in, and they kind of wonder, like, who is this man? What is he doing here, right? They didn't really believe. And then someone else was there that didn't really have a clean spirit about them. They were kind of maybe mean-spirited, or there was something not right with their soul. And they did not know, or they did not believe until that time, that Jesus was who he said he was, right? And so Jesus heals this person, and then suddenly they're like, oh, that is Jesus. And they now believe. And then they left that place, and they, um, they told people all about who Jesus was, and he became kind of famous, okay? So the other thing I want to talk about today is today in Sunday school, Marley is not in here. Do you have those? Um, today, in, oh, Marley is in here. Okay, Marley, what did we talk about in Sunday school today? Do you remember? Uh, sure. Noah. And what did Noah do? Noah built an ark. And does anybody know why did Noah build an ark? Does anybody know? I'm going to ask Carly since Jackson. So go ahead. It was going to rain. And was it going to rain a little bit? It was going to rain a lot. Like, flood. Like, big time. Rain, rain, rain. Can you imagine just days and days? We've had some days that have rained. But can you imagine days and days and weeks of rain? Right? But someone told Noah to build an ark. And that person was... Right, God told Noah to build an ark. And all of the people around Noah thought it was a little crazy. And what are you doing? Here we are, we're going about our life, and we're working, and we're doing all these things, and you are building a giant boat. Kind of crazy, huh? And he told them, that God told them to, to do it. And Marley, what did the people say when, when God asked them to help build? Did they say yes? Do you remember that? Yeah, they said, nope, sorry, Noah's crazy. We're not going to build the, the ark. And so Noah built the ark and told people that the flood was coming, and they didn't believe them. And then what else went on the ark? The animals went on the ark. Two of every animal. That must be a really smelly boat. Huh? So they got on that boat, and the rain came, and God had said that if you obey me, I will keep you safe. And God kept them safe, right? Noah and the animals were all safe. Well, today in Sunday school, Marley, have you shown a little uh, rainbow? We got a little rainbow to remind us that God asks us each to obey Him, or to obey God, and that if we, and He also, God also promises, promises us that never again will God flood the land like he did. Now, that doesn't mean we won't have some floods, right? But never again will God destroy the way that day. And we're promised with the rainbow. So today, I'm giving each of you a little slip of paper. Because just like in our story that they're going to talk about today, they didn't know. Like, they didn't know. They didn't really believe, right? But they saw that um, Jesus was good and Jesus did good things. And so today you can take one of these and have mom and dad um, staple it, or if you just want to use it as a bookmark. But we're, we're reminded that when we love God, and we obey God, and we do good, um, that, that God will be with us, and um, someday we'll be with God in heaven. Correct? All right. So as we leave today, you can take one of these rainbows and be reminded to go out, to love people, to, to learn about God, read your Bible, come to church, invite people, but also show the love of God and share your rainbow with other people. Can you do that? Okay. Your rainbow meaning your, the Spirit of God will go with you. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this beautiful day. We thank you for these children. We thank you for the rainbow. 
the reminder that you loved us so much, and that you gave your life for us, and that when we turn our life to you, that you will keep us safe and we can be with you forever. And be with these children, be with each of us as we leave this place to love you and to love other people. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
Will you please pray with me? Almighty God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all your saints' hearts gathered here this morning in worship might be found good and pleasing. Lord, I pray that we may open our hearts and our minds to your word, to your teaching. Lord, that we may recognize your authority and your power, and that we might rejoice in the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you may cast out those spirits, those thoughts, those things that inhibit us from abundant life in this time. Lord, I ask for your Holy Spirit to be here amongst us, between us, and around us. Lord, we lift up all of these things in your Son, Jesus' name. And all God's people said, So I must begin this morning with a rather pointed question in light of today's reading from Mark. And that is, what is Jesus' authority in our lives? What impact do the teachings of Jesus have upon our lives? Your lives, my life. What power does Jesus have in our lives and over our lives and through them? Over what I say or over what I do? Is it merely a power and an influence when I'm in church that I turn on my I'm now Jesus' disciple as I walk through the door? Is it merely a power or an influence or an authority that is applied when we are doing Christian work in our lives, whether it be a mission trip or whether it be uh, under a, a, a banner of United Methodism or, or of Christianity? Is it a silent devotion? A silent recognition of authority that merely resides in the heart alone and satisfied with thoughts uh, or feelings. And so my question is, to what extent is Jesus Lord in our lives this morning? In one way or another, we are all subject to some kind of authority. Uh, particularly familiar with that this last week and, and this coming week as I've had to uh, interview with several authorities in the church as they are vetting me on my uh, ministry, on my call, and what it means to become an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church. Uh, particularly last week in Nashville, I was reminded not only of my authority as they interviewed me, but of the authority of the military hierarchy as I sat with a former uh, chaplain that was a general, a uh, general over all the chaplains. And so, yes, sir, was my response as I listened to his authority, to his teaching, and also his, his, his questioning and, and testing of me in this way. And, and on Wednesday, I look forward to the authority of the Board of Ordained Ministry, that governing body of both lay and clergy that uh, examined your call and in order to supply ministers uh, in order to, uh, that particular uh, member of the church that brings leadership in that capacity. Uh, that is my interaction with authority and with power most recently. But we're all really tied up in systems of authority and power in one way or another. We have bosses. Some of us have bosses. Uh, we have a government who exercises authority. We have teachers. We have professors. These all have a bearing on our lives in one way or another. They have a bearing on how we live, how we work, how we strive and towards what which we strive, how we achieve, how we relate. The authorities and the powers in our lives determine how happy we are, how fulfilled, or yet perhaps how diminished how exasperated we become. For the nature of authority is a relationship to and a manifestation of power in our lives. Authority is a power exercised over and through and in something, whether it be by title or relationship. And Mark positions two examples of authority and power next to each other in this morning's scripture in a very particular and commanding way of, uh, insofar as what it means to recognize authority and power as a follower of Jesus Christ. And those two uh, positions, those two examples of authority or power are the authority and the power uh, to teach and the authority and power over illness and corruption and malevolent powers, the authority to heal 
and to restore. Now first we reviewed uh, Jesus' authority and power through the lens of teacher. That he teaches from not the scribes who merely learn and teach uh, what they've learned, but from a peculiar uh, and particular inspiration that Jesus knows. Uh, it's like the professor that not only teaches from the book, but he wrote the book. And that's very apt for Scripture since Jesus wrote the book in this way. Jesus is the Word, and so the Word is teaching directly. And the amazement at his teaching in Mark is, is that he's not like a scribe because it is inferred that he teaches like a prophet. That in the Old Testament there is that common referring, Thus saith the Lord. It is the Lord talking and speaking and teaching directly to the Lord's people. And so as Jesus mounted the pulpit or, or whatever speaking uh, element they had in the, in the synagogue, Jesus is teaching from authority. Thus saith the Lord. And as Christians, thus saith the Lord Jesus Christ. And with such authority uh, is always paired with a particular conviction, a power, an authenticity that when we see it, we know it. And often our response is, wow, or my Lord and my God. And it's not indifference. It is not being lukewarm in that, in that way. And the second manifestation and element of Jesus' authority and power in today's scripture comes from the story of the first exorcism in the book of Mark. That authority over the unclean spirit. And to the point that uh, the unclean spirit recognizes Jesus. But here, here is the point of it all. And that is Jesus is more powerful. Jesus is higher in, this, in, 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 the, in the hierarchy uh, of this spirit's understanding. And Jesus commands and exercises authority. Be gone. Silence over the demon. Authority and he over health and well-being. So for while the, the demon is exercised or the, the unclean spirit is cast out, the, the underlying point is that Jesus restores health and well-being. And this will continue throughout the Gospel of Mark as Jesus heals, makes whole people whole, as Jesus casts out more demons, as Jesus casts out demons that now look like particular illnesses. But nevertheless, the point is, Jesus makes whole. Jesus brings health. Jesus cleans the spirit in this way. And Jesus restores this man who previously was screaming in anguish or in anger. And Jesus, by his action, demonstrates the will of God and that the will of God is life, abundant life. Jesus is Lord. And in our lives and in our world, competing powers and authorities rage over and over, pull us in different directions. We, but the, the most uh, intimate and, and, and immediate one of those is the power of ourselves. And we often place ourselves in the driver's seat, uh, this illusion of our own power in our lives. Uh, we say to ourselves, I'm my own authority. I make my own decisions. I make my own choices. I exercise my own will and my own power. Now, that might be true in a blink of a thought, but now that we're later into January, I'm sure we've had some failed New Year's resolutions where we realize our power to avoid that snack or to go to the gym is just a little bit inadequate. That with these failures of resolutions or whenever our power seems exhausted, we realize that in fact we do not have uh, unlimited power. That we are finite. That we are restricted. And that most often other things in our life control us, sway us, pull us one way or another. Plans change. Limited understanding inhibits us. A shifting circumstance. We run into those people that confront us or refute us when we try to make a claim or, or an argument or express a desire. And so our powers and authority begins to get uh, pulled uh, to the others, uh, competing powers in our lives. We yield to the power and the authority of chronic exhaustion, which overpowers us and leaves our lives drained by busy schedules, by being stretched too thin to the point of breaking or tearing or wearing. There is the terror of the deadline that oppresses us, of work, of projects, of stress, stacked upon our shoulders until we seem to take heavier steps because it would weigh so much in our minds. There's the power and the authority of other persons over us. As already mentioned, 
uh, those just in casual relationships, but also those that sow disappointment or undo or misled expectation in our lives. Relationships that drain life and vitality. Those relationships that are superficial. As superficial as a, a friend on Facebook, I might argue. And then there's that digital diet that seems to oppress us and the power of advertising everywhere we go, it seems, that possesses our minds and our eyes, captures our hearts and claims authority over us. Look this way. We, we, it is the right way, we hear. Be this. Wear this. Be conservative. Be liberal. Eat this. Drive that. The list could go on. And then as, as we interact with these different powers and pulls in our lives, and we peel back these layers, and we realize that we are not always in control, we also realize that sin has a power and authority in our life, and that it creeps and seeps very subtly into our minds and our hearts. There's the power of pride, of wealth, of possessions, and power and prestige and connections, a uh, perceived ability to judge other people. There is greed as an authority in our lives that commands our decisions, that draws our eyes. Where we always want what we don't have. Uh, there's the demon of envy, that green-eyed monster that brings dissatisfaction with self and contempt for the other. There's that empty pit of gluttony that forms in our hearts that whisper that says, More, more, more. There's lust that shackles us. A worship of the flesh, of the object, of that which brings uh, satisfaction, yet always leaves us thirsting and hunger for more. There's laziness that bogs us down, sucks the purpose from our actions, and then there's the demon of wrath, of anger, of rage that is a damning possession. A response not of love, but fear, and it controls us. And it impresses us. These things in our lives become demons, become competing authorities and powers over our decisions, over our identity, and over how we live our lives. So many things vie to have power over us, to teach us not from a base of what is real, but what is twisted and maligned and jumbled in priority. And these things are our demons. And why do we fantasize about personified demons? There's so many exorcism and demon movies out there. And we seem to be fascinated with that which commands and oppresses the human, uh, human being in this way. But why are we obsessed with these personified demons in movies and such, where there's such a more common and sundry demon that whispers to us and entices us towards the such damnation on the daily, it seems? And demons are uh, throughout Mark. There's a reality in Mark's gospel that Jesus casts out these demons. And the writer of Mark had a very real understanding of those, that which was spiritually maligned, that which is spiritually evil. And we can acknowledge that, but we can also extend it. That like them, our souls shout in anguish often. Like those who shout, Jesus, what do you have to do with us? Why can't you just leave us in our darkness in this way? That we walk... Uh, we shout in those similar ways in our hearts. That we walk around not knowing our purpose like ghosts. That we feel burdened and we feel out of control by these things. But our good news this morning, and we do have good news, is that there is another authority. There is a stronger and a higher and a deeper and a more ancient power for us as the Christian church. An authority that, like the others similar in this form, insofar as what it demands of us is our whole lives, the attention of our heart, the complete attention of our hearts, our minds, and our actions. Uh, there is this other authority, however, who teaches and overcomes, uh, but not by sowing death or dissatisfaction, but life in abundance. And there is another Lord who does not grind down to dust, but lifts up, who does not wound but heals, a Lord not of lies, but of the truth. A Lord that does not stack uh, burdens without purpose, but liberates, alleviates, and gives us task and purpose that simultaneously builds up strength and joy and belonging and vitality. 
And this, and I'm sure it's the name in your minds and hearts at this moment, is our Lord Jesus. Jesus who teaches the will of God with authority, for He is God. Jesus who has authority, command and power over all, heaven and earth. Authority and power over the legions of demons that haunt humanity in many forms. And so I ask this question again, echoing it from the first. What is Jesus' authority in our lives? What power does Jesus have in our lives? And the answer to this is actually fairly simple. It's as much power and authority as we give Jesus. As much power and authority as we confess and yield. As much as we give ourselves and as much as we allow. You see, the oldest Christian confession uh, of faith is not the Nicene Creed, uh, and it's not the Apostles' Creed, nor is it even an articulation of a scripture, uh, of by chapter or by verse, but it is a phrase, a confession, a confession that led people to the lion's pit and to the cross, a confession that brought both death, but also life that uh, undermines such death, and that was this confession that Jesus is Lord. It is our most ancient Confession as Christians. Jesus is Lord. Lord, Jesus is the authority of our hearts and our minds and our bodies and put together our entire lives. Romans 10.9 uh, echoes a familiar voice. If you confess with your lips and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. But so often the confession of our lips that Jesus is Lord is an outward disposition. A belief in the heart isn't simply a telling of, I believe in Jesus, though that can be a witness and a testimony. Jesus is Lord, we say it to those that challenge us, to those that are persecuting us. But rather, the primary and the first confession of Jesus as Lord is in the heart. It's at the level of our hearts, and it's aimed towards ourselves. It's aimed at our own hearts first. It is a submission of the heart and our lives and an offering of all that we have and are to the Lordship and the authority and the power of Christ. You cannot say Jesus is Lord with your lips and at the same time believe that Jesus is Lord in your heart if you do not uh, direct that to yourself. If that becomes your confession, Jesus is Lord And then we can add to that, Jesus is Lord of my life, to make it personal, to make it immediate. Jesus is Lord of our lives as we gather here this morning. And so this is my invitation to you. Let us consider Jesus' authority in our lives. And let us come to the conclusion that it cannot be partial, or secondhand, or irrelevant, or incomplete, But rather, the authority of Jesus and the power of Jesus in our lives must be totalizing. Let us offer our hearts to Christ, whose teaching and authority is truth. The very heart and mind and spirit and being of God. Let us offer our hearts and selves to Christ, whose power is over all the demons and a legion of forms which possess our lives. And let us embrace the power and the will of God through Christ to heal us, to let us sigh with relief and joy and beauty in this life, to give us resolution, a resolute and authentic purpose to our lives and the work and the love that we, that we exercise, to give us that opaque, substantial, and very real love and belonging as community, as the church. And so let us be a party to such a power, such an authority, and and such a truth and love this morning. Let us confess, I invite you to, to confess in our hearts and then conform with our lives to this statement of faith, Jesus is Lord. Let us be transformed, made new, made real, made alive. Jesus is Lord. Let our prayer be, Lord Jesus, lead us into life. Amen. I invite you to respond.
Let us pray. We have heard a new teaching from Jesus, this Nazarene, who speaks with authority. We have seen how Christ commands even unclean spirits to flee, and they obey him. And Jesus calls us to exercise demons in every form they take. God of grace and God of mercy, grant us wisdom for the facing of this hour and for all the hours and days of our lives. Amen. This time I invite you to join in our hymn of response, Silence, Frenzy, Unclean Spirit. The words are found uh, on 264, but the tune will be different, so I invite you not to be thrown off by the different tune. Let us sing together.
and aching of heart. Lord, those that are hungry, both in body and in soul, Lord, I pray that you might be with them. And you might fill them, fill us with good things. Lord of life, you bring healing, you bring wholeness, you bring strength, and so we ask for these things this morning. Lord, we ask that you might empower your church through your Holy Spirit. Lord, we are bold to pray for revival, that you might revive our hearts, and the breath and the wind of your Spirit might work upon that spark, even if it's a smolder in our hearts, and reignite our love for you. Lord, let each breath we take breathe in your grace and your love, and may such love and grace be written in our actions, written on our faces, that we might look like Christ in our lives. Lord, we ask that we might live in your truth, and by your authority, and by your power. Lord, we lift up a special prayer for those who lead us, those who lead us in, in this church, those who lead us in the Methodist church, those who lead us in this community, this state, this nation, and this world. Lord, we pray that they might uh, recognize your power and your authority and your will for life. Lord, we lift up a prayer for military personnel, Lord, that you might keep them safe, be their shield and their rock in the midst of hardship and harrowing uh, difficulty. Lord, we pray for all those who serve humanity, who put their minds and their hearts and their hands to work for your kingdom. And Lord, we are bold in the midst of the most difficult headlines, the most tragic headlines, to pray, and not naively so, for peace in your world. Lord, that peace may manifest as your people, transformed and set to work. Lord, receive now those silent prayers of our hearts. <coughs> God, listening to the prayers of our hearts, two deeper words. Lord, listening to the prayers of those prayer requests lifted in the voice. We pray now together in voice, in one voice, the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread.
Christ to the world, that we might recognize the power and the authority of Jesus Christ, and that such power and authority brings us life and life abundant. Go forth in peace, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.